All right, we're going to continue on with the book. They were white and they were slaves. The untold history of enslaved whites in early America. And we're on the chapter of the factory system. In 1830, the Reverend Richard Ostler, <clears throat> he's a Methodist minister in York, protested the conditions in Bradford Woolen Mills where young children labored and were beaten if they fell asleep. Ostler attacked the hypocrisies of Yorkshire clergymen and politicians who condemned with great fervor the enslavements of blacks in the West Indies, while in England, thousands of our fellow creatures are this very moment in a state of slavery more horrid than are the victims of the hellish system colonial slavery. The very streets which receive the droppings of an anti-slavery society are every morning wet by the tears of innocent victims at the accursed shrines of avarice who are compelled not by the cart wit of the Negro slave driver, but by the dread of the equally appalling thong or strap of the overlooker to hasten the half dress, but not half fed to those magazines of British infantile slavery, the worsened meals in the towns of Bradford. Osler was publicly thanked by a delegation of English laborers at a meeting in York for his main manly letters to expose the conduct of those pretended philanthropists and Candace hypocrites who traveled to the West Indies in search of slavery forgetting that there is a more abominable and degrading system of slavery at home. The industrial revolutionary factory labor force consisted prim primarily of white children from the workhouses who were seized and placed in the factories under a spurious indentured apprentice system. Here then was a ready source of labor and a very welcome one. The children provided with employment would be rescued from pauperism and the ratepayers, the taxpayers, would be relieved of their part of the burden. So mill owners began to appear in London, visiting parish officers and making the necessary arrangements. The children were formerly indentured as apprentices. What happened to them was nobody's concern. A parish in London, having got rid of a batch of unwanted pauper children, was unlikely to was unlikely to interest itself in their subsequent fate. The term apprenticeship was in any case a misnomer. Many employers imported child apprentices, parish orphans from house workers, workhouses far and near. Clearly overseers of the poor were only too keen to get rid of the orphans. Children were brought to the factories like, by, like cartloads of live lumber and abandoned to their fate, poor children, taken from workhouses or kidnapped in the streets of the metropolis, used to be brought down by coach to Manchester and slid into a cellar in Mosley, well, Mosley Street as if they have been stones or any other inanimate substance. Seen indentured as pauper apprentices, children lost all ability to negotiate the terms of their bound labor. The term apprentice but a misnomer because they were not being taught a trade. Machine tending was a custodial function, not a skill. You hear me? Machine tending is a custodial function. It's not a skill. They knew this in factory work. A child labeled an indentured apprentice will be paid a penance and forced to work the longest hours, for example, to induce free English adults to work a night shift at a factory would have cost the owner more in wages. These disadvantages terms were avoided by compelling the enslaved children to work at night. British children comprise a majority of the factory work forced from two thirds to two, three quarters of the workers in the early factories. They were lucky if they earned a half penny an hour. For this, they were made to work as children had never been made to work before. For the sake of a shilling a week, at the age of five, children who had to be carried to work and who once there had been terrorized to stay awake, white children worked up to 16 hours a day. 
And during that period, the doors were locked. Children and most of the mill workers were still children, were allowed out only to go to the necessary. White children worked up to 16 hours a day, and during that period, the doors locked. <laughs> children and most of the mill workers were still children. type of men that came to this country and overworked us. You don't want to fight against this? Yeah, you want to fight against this, right? Yeah, we're going to fight against this. Tooth and nail, we're going to get our freedom, I promise you. <laughs> we're going to get our freedom. <laughs> yeah. We're coming for the system. Oh, yeah. It's factories. They ain't nothing but modern-day slavery. Here in parenthood, ain't nothing but child sacrifices. <laughs> the prison industrial system, ain't nothing but a emasculation ritual. Everything needs to be exposed now because these are people who treat their own children in their own country like this. I want y'all to realize this type of evil. This is why I'm so emotional about this. We're fighting against a real draconian system right now of mental illness. How do you treat your own native men, children this way? How? Yeah. We're going to keep on going and get it together, Cornelius. White children were worked up to 16 hours a day. And <clears throat> during that period, the doors were locked. Children and most of the mill workers were still children were allowed on, out only to go to the necessary and in some factories wait what, most of the mill workers were still children were allowed out only to go to the necessary and in some factories it was forbidden to open any of the windows cotton fluff was everywhere including on the children's food but only as they had to stand all day they were too fatigued to have any appetite the child apprentices <clears throat> who were on night shift might stay on it for as long as four or five years, although they were provided with dinner at midnight. The machineries did not stop. This was labor without any break, unceasing labor. When the children fell asleep at the machines, they were lashed into wakefulness with a whip, alternatively known as a thong or a strap. If they arrived late to the factory, 
talk to another child or committed some other infraction that they were beaten with an iron bar known as a billy roller. A contemporary witch's witness described the factory children of Manchester, England, as almost universally ill-looking, small, sickly, barefoot, and ill-clad. Francis Trollo in the room they entered, the dirty, ragged, miserable crew were all active in the performance of their various tasks, the onlookers strapped in hand on the alert, the whirling spindles urging the little slaves who waited on them to movement as unceasing as their own. The essential features of the factory life as it developed in England was that the children were enslaved. Charles Shaw was a child laborer laborer from the age of seven beginning in 1839. When an adult, he wrote a book about his experiences. Fortunes were piled up on the pitiless toilings of the little children, and thousands of them never saw manhood or womanhood. Their young life was used as tillage for the quick growth of wealth. Charles Saw, 1839. I have seen sights of sickening brutality. These little white slaves were flogged at times as brutality, brutally, all things considered, as Legory flogged Uncle Tom. Nearly all England wept about 13 years later for Uncle Tom, especially the classes, but no fine lady or gentleman wept for the cruelly, cruel, cruelly used, which were the English children. White children in the early factories were sometimes beaten to death, killed by blows from overseers. Statement of Henry Dunn, the overseer carries a strap. The boys are severely strapped. It was a tender to every flat, and it was considered as a sort of whipper in and forced the children to extra exertion, seeing wounds inflicted upon children by tenders by Alexander Drydale, among others, with a belt or a stick or first thing that came uppermost, uppermost, saw a kick given by a, above mentioned Alexander Drysdale, which broke two ribs of a little boy, helped to carry the boy down a surgeon. The boy had been guilty of some trifling offense, such as calling names to the next boy. Testimony of Ellen Ferrer, factory worker. When Charles Kennedy was the overseer, he licked us every bad. He licked us very bad beat our heads, and kicked us very bad. Testimony of Mary Scott, factory worker, was, was here with Charles Kennedy, seeing him strike Betty Sutherland. Can't tell how often, but it was terrible often. John Fortesh, an overseer at the Maline factory in Nottingham, England, gave the following statement. There are some children so obstinate and bad that they must be punished. A bad strap is used, beating is necessary on an account of their being idle. We find it out of this way. We give them the same number of bobbins each. When the number they ought to finish falls off, then they are corrected. They would try the patience of any man. Isn't it the same system that they used in America? It's the same thing. So they had a ration that they had to a quota every day. <laughs> And then they got punished if they didn't meet that quota. They just brought all of these practices over to America. Statements from Mr. Grant, a Manchester factory worker, April 1833. A child not 10 years of age, having been late at the factory one morning, had, had as a punishment a rope put around his neck to which a weight of 20 pounds was attached. And thus, like a galley slave, he was compelled to labor with the 20 pound Statements by Reverend Oyster London in 1833. He says, in a mill at Wingen, the children, for any slight neglect, were loaded with weights of 20 pounds passed over their shoulders and hanging behind their backs. Then there was a murderous instrument called a billy roller, about eight feet long and one inch and a half in diameter, with which many children had been knocked down and in some instances murdered by it. An unknown writer expressed the bitter feelings of early British factory workers. I'm up but weary, a scarce can reach the door, and long the day and dreary, oh, carry me once more, to help us with no mother, to live how hard we try. They killed my little brother, like him, I'll work and die. 
April 14, 1833, Birmingham Journal. In Black House, Dickens was to satirical, evangelical, telescopic philanthropy in the person of Mr. Jellyboy, a Don Gooder, so observed in the welfare of African natives of the Borabula, Ghana, that she failed to notice her own family sinking into ruin. This was pricely Caroline's point with Irish dying in ditches. It was the worst sort of rose pink sentimentalism to worry some oneself about a West Indian Negro. In the late 1830s, William Dodd began his exhaustive research in the conditions of the English poor. He estimated that in the year 1846 alone, 10,000 English workers, many of them children, had been mangled and mutilated by machinery other or otherwise disabled for life. They were abandoned and received no compensation of any kind. Many died of their injuries. Among factory children, many suffered from scrofula. And this is incipient consumption visible by the enlarged neck glands and white swellings of the joints. At best, children who survived into an adolescence outgrew the disease, though the deformities themselves persisted. In some cases, however, limbs had to be amputated, and at worst, children worked until they died. Young children are allowed to clean the machineries actually while it is in motion, and consequently the fingers, hands, and arms are frequently destroyed in a moment. I've seen the whole of the arm from the tip of the fingers to a, the bow of the elbow chopped into minced meat, the cog wheels cutting through the skin, muscles, and in, in some places through the bone. And in one instance, every limb but one was broken. Accidents were often due to children being set to clean machinery while it was still in motion. The loss of two or three fingers was not exceptional. There were more serious accidents, accidents, such as that reported by a stock doctor in 1840 of a girl caught by the hair and scalped from the nose to the back of the head. The manufacturer gave her five shillings. She died in the workhouse. In 19th century factory worker William Dodd stated, petition after petition had been sent to the two houses of parliament to the prime minister and to the queen concerning these unfortunate classes of British subjects were without effect. Had they only black, been black instead of white, their case would have been taken into consideration long ago. Wow. This was in 19th century factories in England. They was being treated worse than the poor black people. Wow. And they sent this letter to the parliament. <sighs> <laughs> the Reverend Charles Edward Lester, the great grandson of the Puritan theologian Jonathan Edwards and later the American consul in Italy, stated that if he had a choice between having his children born Negro slaves in the South or poor people in England, he would choose the former. I would sooner see the children of my love born to the heritage of Southern slavery than to see them subjected to the blightening bondage of the poor English operative's operative life. <laughs> and this is said in Leicester, The Glory of the Shame of England, Volume 1. John Randolph of Roanoke, traveling in England and Ireland with his Black manservant, Johnny, wrote to a friend back home, much as I was prepared to see misery in the south of Ireland, I was utterly shocked at the conditions of the poor pe peasantries between Limbrick and L Dublin. Why, sir, John never felt so proud of being a big the Virginia slave. <laughs> he looked with horror upon the mud hovels and miserable food of the white slaves and had no fear of his running away. Less Americans imagine that such practices never darkened our shores. Readers are referred to the documentary literature on white children labor in American factories, especially Markham Lindsay and, Creel, and Creel's Children in Bondage, Ruth Holland's Mill Child and Lewis Hines, The Photograph of Child Labor. By 1801, Samuel Slater's factory, one of the first built in America, 
Samuel Slater's factory in 1801, one of the first factories built in America. <clears throat> he employed over 100 children. The oldest was 10. The youngest was four years old. The Theopolis Biss in Connecticut publisher and Jackson Democrat is ranked as one of the major leaders of the early U.S. labor movement. Biss denounced wealthy white campaigners for Negro rights and to 1836 gave what has been described as a fierce anti-abolitionist speech in South Carolina. Biss anger derived from his observation that white slavery had been ignored. This found that American slaves had pale faces and his abolitionisms grew in Boston, called for an end to indulging sympathies for blacks in the South and for the immediate emancipation of white factory slaves of the North. Oh, wow. So the Northern white people in the factories were being treated worse than the slaves down in the South. Charles Douglas, president of the New England Association of Farmers, Mechanics and other working men described the 4,000 white children and women at the work in the factories of Lowell, Lowell, Massachusetts in the 1860s as dragging out a life of slavery and wretchedness. These establishments in New England factories are the present abode of wretchedness, disease, and misery. Ruth Holland commented on the participation of New England's factory owners in the cause of abolitionism and rights for Negroes in the South observed, it's a little difficult to believe that Northern's mill owners who were mercilessly abusing white children for profit felt such pure moral indignations at Negro slavery. Right, that's a contradiction, right? Why did they want them free so much when they was treating kids this way? No respect for human life. Next chapter, human brooms. <laughs> I gotta love this book. <laughs> it's got me on all kinds of emotions, up and down, up and down. <laughs> Let me take a break. Oh, hope you guys enjoy this book as much as I am. Like I say, I'm not always sure why I have to read books, but now I understand I have some emotions in me about this. So this is information that I just forgot. When I read it at the time, my father wasn't as empathetic because I hated white people. So it was like, good. But now it's like, I'm thinking differently about this now. This is an American shame of white people. This has to be an American shame. This is so horrible. This is what's fueling y'all shame and guilt right here. Y'all need to be healing this right here. This is for y'all. This book is for y'all. God got to be reading this to help y'all heal this in y'all. And then white people who are interested in learning about history. It doesn't show y'all in a good light. This is a really good book. So you can be exposed to this. Accept it. Release all of this and heal. Karmically, this is what we need to be incarnating. These slaves from y'all past. So black people got to do it. I know y'all got to do it. <laughs> y'all got to do it as well. So y'all got to go through the same process as us. So we're going to talk about y'all as being used as human brooms now. This is the next chapter. 
Thousands of white children in Great Britain were forced to work as human brooms inside chimney flues and led miserable lives and died horrid deaths. The conditions of these chimney sweepers reveals perhaps more than other forms of white slavery. The attitude of the ruling class toward the most defenseless and oppressed segments of the surplus white poor. Chimney sweeping had been practiced as a trade as far back as the Tudor era. But the customs of forcing young boys to sweep flu flues with brushes and scrapers probably did not become general until the 18th century. British cities in the Georgian era were festooned with forest rooftops, brick and mortar. Several flues were usually installed in each of the chimneys of a Georgian mansion to satisfy the 18th century demand for more comfortable indoor heating, a fireplace in nearly every room being the new yardstick of comfort. As the number of flues increased, their size increased, and the average being approximately 10 to 14 inches. Children were essential for their maintenance. The very architecture of Georgian England now reflected the doorway stage statues of the white pauper child. Like the white children enslaved in the factories, they had been recruited from the workhouses as pauper apprentices. <clears throat> Parish officials tried to get rid of pauper children as soon as they were old enough by apprenticing them to any master who would take them. These included the mastering of chimney sweeps, for whom then malnourished boys as young as four were considered ideal for their facility for entering narrow smoke channels. An 18th century eyewitness to the system of child chimney sweeps, Jonas Hanway, Hanway stated, that it was equal to any of the miseries which human nature seems capable of supporting. And if the evil is suffered to reign any longer, it must level us with nations whom we call barbarians. If it does not ultimately draw down on us through vengeance of heaven, heaven. Chimney sweets was often little more than thinly disguised slavery. It was not uncommon to see the children up the chimneys while they were still on fire or to place flaming straw in the grate beneath the child who had entered the chimney but refused to go all the way up. Skeletal deformities and cripplings were a common, as were fatal accidents. An eyewitness account tell of a boy called to a job that needed to be done in haste. The child entered the flu but quickly came out again saying that it was too hot. The master told him to make as much haste as he could. He was a long time going up, heard him cry out, he was hung to a nail, heard him crying and sobbing very much, very near nine o'clock, having been up at about 20 minutes, never heard any more. Upon asking the boy's master, he sent another boy up after him. He went as far as he could reach his toes. The child said that he could not pull him down. He won't come down, master, he said, damn him. The builder who extricated the boy said that he was very difficult as he was so wedged in and the flu was so exceedingly hot. The flu was 14 inches by 12 that in the suit and the heat, the builder testified, must have caused the boy's death by suffocation. These boys who escaped death often extracted cancer. In 1775, Percival Pot observed an overwhelming number of young chimney sweet sufferers from scrotal cancer. He believed that the horrendous disease in these malnourished boys kept thin <coughs> by their employers to fit down the chimneys was caused by their constant exposure to soot. But the English government took more than 50 years to pass laws to protect them. In handbills and advertisements, the masters of chimney suites would boast that they were in possession of small boys from the best work inside flues. Little boys with small flues was a popular advertising slogan. In the early 19th century, investigations revealed that no child could be found. I'm sorry, this spirit of bail just entered into my mind. This is what this sounds like, child sacrifice. This is a spirit. <clears throat> this is what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Parent parenthood. Spirit of Bell. 
Spirit of Baal. This is what this is. <clears throat> they were all either orphans or indignant, sold by the parish house workers. I'm sorry, my throat is getting all scratchy for some reason. <clears throat> Let's go. They were all either orphans and indignant sold by the parish house workers into servitude, or they had been kidnapped or sold by famished parents to a master of sweeps. The boys often had to be forced up the flues with slaps, kicks, beatings, and sometimes fire. On January 17, 1831, John Pacey, tenured years of age, was sent up a flu at Omnibus Coffee House. It appears that the brick work was decayed and that when the boy had reached the top, the whole chimney caved in, gave way. The child was found with his skull crushed. March 1832, an 11-year-old boy was ordered by his master D. Casey to ascend a smoke-filled chimney. The boy was afraid to enter it. Casey, regardless of his natural apprehensions, beat him until he mounted. The lad suffocated to death. September 1st, 1832, Michael Brian, Brian, apprentice chimney sweep to Philip Corbett, was engaged to sweep some chimneys in the house of George Barron. He arrived at Mr. Barron's about seven o'clock in the kitchen fire, having been lighted before that hour. Corbett said it would not be necessary to put out the fire for the purpose of sweeping the chimney, as he would cover it with slack. Having covered the fire with slack, he desired the boy to be ascend the chimney and commence operation. The boy immediately obeyed, but before he proceeded many yards, cried out that the chimney was too hot to advance further. The master desired him to rattle away, as the chimney was cool enough. The child continued to ascend with the greatest pain and difficulty. A tremendous blaze rushed up the chimney, and a little sufferer succeeded in reaching the top of the chimney and thence the roof of the house. A ladder was immediately procured, and the boy was brought down by Mr. Barron's servants. The appearance of the boy's body was truly distressing, having been dreadfully scorched and burned. He died about 12 hours later. October 10, 1832, a chimney sweeper named William Cakebread, between six and seven years of age, was employed in sweeping an outbuilt flue at the back of the premises, number 36 Oxford Street, when from the rottenness of the brickwork, the hole fell from the tremendous crash into the backyard, just as he had reached the top and buried him underneath masses of brickwork and rubbish on being taken, taken to the Middlesex Hospital. He survived only a few hours when he expired in great agony. January 15, 1834. A small boy was inside a chimney when it burst into flames. He was speedily conveyed to the hospital where he remained some time in a state of excruciating agony and died. In May 1839, a boy, William Wilson, also ordered to clean a flue that was still hot from a fire that had recently been extinguished. He was grievously burned and hospitalized for weeks, on which he was described by a caregiver as a meek, gentle little creature. The tears started in his eyes when he was spoken kindly to. There are many such cases on record commiserate with the investigations arising from the foundings of reform societies in the early 19th century, newspaper accounts, reports of human societies, and preliminary records contain hundreds of instances of climbing boys injured and killed, beaten and burned, deformed and diseased. Since conditions were even worse before the trade came under scrutiny, it is fair to surmise that hundreds of equally fatal or harrowing cases dating from the 18th century went unreported. It is no doubt difficult today to understand the rationale behind anyone sending a young child up a chimney while the fire was still lit in, in the grate. The grasp and the mentality of the higher orders of the society of the time it is necessary to appreciate the utter expendability of the lives of the proper white children as compared with the necessity of maintaining every luxury of the high born. 
One observer writing in the Edinburgh Review in 1819 stated, we come down to burning little chimney sweepers. A large party is invited to dinner. A great display is to be made. And about an hour before dinner, there is an alarm that the kitchen chimney is on fire. It is impossible to put off and distinguish personages who are expected. It is it great very late for the soup and fish. The cook is frantic. All eyes are turned upon the sable consolation of the chimney sweep. And up into the midst of the burning chimney is sent one of the miserable infants of the brush. Bills proposed in Parliament requiring the abolition of the use of climbing boys under the age of 10 were defeated in the House of Lords in 1804, 1818, and twice in 1819. These were the climbing boy laws. <clears throat> the Earl of Lauderdale argued against any restraint of the practices of the masters of the chimney sweeps on the basis that children should be considered free agents for wage bargaining purposes. Lord Milton declared the idea of outlawing the use of young children in the chimney overly hasty since only very small children could possibly fit into the narrow flues. It would have required only a small expenditure by a homeowner to have the chimney altered and widened to permit their cleaning by adults or machines, however. Lord Sidney Smith sneered at the humanitarian appeals for saving the lives of white children and pressed into chimney sweeping. Humanity, observed Smith, is a modern invention. <laughs> he said humanity is a modern invention. <laughs> Lord Smith further stated that such a measure for the reform of the chimney sweep trade, we are convinced from the evidence, could not be carried into execution without great injury to property. In the, yeah, like the human property. Oh, the non-human property. He was more concerned about the non-human property compared to the human property, the human injuries. In the English parliament, property rights were ruled paramount when legislation was proposed for preserving the lives and health of the poor white children. Property rights were ruled to be of secondary consideration, however. when the cause of the emancipating Negroes came to the fore. So they were always comparing the liberation of these kids, white kids to the emancipation of Negroes. It didn't make sense because they were still trying to create distinguishment of their white superiority, though they were suppressing a group of white people. Wow. And they knew black people would tackle or at least fight against that. How is it that we're free or white all known they wanted to claim distinction of their classism over these pauper white people and they knew by freeing the black people it would cause the white people to rebel the poor whites <laughs> that makes so much sense now yes and during this time the atrocities visited upon the white children who climbed inside the chimneys of the wealth was of little consequence compared with the massive attention given to the conditions of the Negroes of America. When Parliament abolished Negro slavery in 1808, the flues of its August chambers were being climbed by boys four, five, and six years of age sold to chimney sweepers for prices ranging from a few shillings to two guineas. The smaller the child, the better the price. David Ricardo commented upon the attempt to protect child laborers, wrote that the legislator must not be allowed to infringe on the rights of the owners of property, unless, of course, that property was a black slave rather than a white one. Where the enslaved white children who served as human brooms came to the attention of the public at all, it was usually in terms of drollery and the, the pyrrhic, the pickering. P I C. <laughs> this is why I got this for. <laughs> the English essay, essayist Charles Lamb 
painted a rosy picture of their suffering, celebrating them as a kind of charming aesthetic prop, a delightful spectacle of almost clergy imps decorating the roofs of London from their little pulpits. He said their little pulpits. <laughs> Can you imagine them sitting up there looking dirty? <laughs> <laughs> In 1822, Charles Lamb often quoted praise for chimney sweepers appear in the London magazines to bring a smile to the readers' faces as he noted the author's kindly yearning toward these dim, spec poor blots who could enjoy the whimsical scenes of the shivering black hood boys drinking his morning dish of salute tea to be amused by the little fellow, his poor eyed red eyes, red from many a previous weeping and, snoot and snoots inflamed. Lamb, although successful in provoking a chuckle, did not attempt to bring a tear to the reader's eye. He might refer to the kid heels, the early dawn working hours, the rag and filthy clothes, the red red eyes, yet with the magic of romanticism, he woes the facts of hardship and sorrow so definitely into the fanciful Im imagery that the misery of the boy is softened and lost sight of, as if chimney sweepers and climbing boys had been translated to the world of restoration comedies. The most striking illustration of this upper class attitude of depraved indifference to the agonies of poor white children can be seen in the case of Mrs. Elizabeth Montag, a very rich lady who took Lamb's whimsy, Lamb's whimsy to greater heights in regarding herself as a patroness of London's penurious children actually had extra chimneys constructed on her Sandalford Priory so that climbing boys might have the pleasure of sweeping them and she the pleasure of observing the children's for sport. The lives of poor white children continued to be sacrificed even when machine cleaning became feasible without alteration of any kind being made to flues. In 1828, Joseph Glass improved the designs of the chimney cleaning machine invented earlier by George Smart. The new modifications rendered the cleaning of every flue by meaning of contravenience an inexpensive and efficient means of foregoing child labor for the purpose. The device was mostly ignored by the masters of sweepers. <clears throat> Even though they could afford it. They would rather abuse these children. Just to let you see the evil in these people. <clears> the <throat> device was mostly ignored by the masters of sweeps and homeowners alike because English boys cost even less than the affordable cleaning machines. The cost of glass machines with a ball and brush amounted to four pounds. Yet sweeps preferred boys whom they could easily obtain in almshouses or on the streets. They made the boys beg their food, so the upkeep was almost nothing. Whereas the machine was liable to wear and tear, the child was forced to work, often when he was ill. Moreover, the machine required the combined efforts of a master and journeyman. The child swept the chimney unaided. It is possible, asked the reformer of J.C. Hudson, that women whose love of infants is said to be so strong can persist in employing little children for this purpose? The answer was yes. Samuel Robertson, in an 1834 essay on the boys used in chimney sweeps, addressed his indignations toward the upper class British females who met in their sumptuously appointed parlors to weep with tender hearted solicitude over the latest accounts from American from America of oppression to Negroes, while in the next room, scarred and burned five-year-old English boys enslaved as human brooms were being forced up the ladies' chimney without a thought for their welfare. There is a race of human beings in this country, the chimney sweepers climbing boys, which is more oppressed than the Negroes in which the West Indy Islands or the North America. These objects are all young and helpless. Their employment 
is tenfold more horrible than that of any attachment to the Negro slaves. A far greater number of them are crippled and rendered deformed for life. A far greater proportion of them die in consequence of hard usage, while the horrible deaths from suffocation, burning, and other accidents are in this case beyond measure more numerous. And all this at home within our knowledge, before our eyes and our very houses, the shame how many of these poor infants arrive at years of maturity of those who die young, who knows, who cares anything about them. The death of any of our favorite dogs would be more lamented. Next chapter, breaking the chains of illusion. Yes, let's break this chain, honey. Historian Oscar Handelin writes that a colonial America, white servants could be bartered for a profit, sold to the highest bidder for the unpaid debts of their masters and otherwise transferred like movable goods or shadows. In every civic, social, and legal attribute, these victims of the turbulent displacements of the 16th and 17th century were set apart. Despised, despised by every other order, without apparent means of rising to a more favored place, these men and their children and their children's children seemed mired in a hard, degraded life. The conditions of the first Negroes in the continental English colonies must be viewed within the perspective of these conceptions and realities of white servitude. This is in the book Origins of the Southern Labor System by William and Mary Quarterly, April 1950. The history of enslavement in America as portrayed in the tunnel vision of the corporate media has focused exclusively on the enslavement of Negroes. Mm -hmm. The impression is given that only whites bear responsibility for enslaving Negroes and only Negroes were enslaved. In fact, Negroes in Africa, as well as American Indian tribes, such as the Cherokee engaged in extensive enslavements of Negroes. Mm. The Cherokee Indians owned large plantations in which they worked their Negro slaves in gangs. White slaves were actually owned by Negroes and Indians in the South to such an extent that the Virginia Assembly passed the following law in 1670. It is enacted that no Negro or Indian, though baptized and enjoyed their own freedom, shall be capable of any such purchase of Christians. And this is in the Statutes of the Virginia Assembly, Volume 2. Negroes also own other Negroes in America. While whites languished in chains, in chains blacks were free men in Virginia throughout the 17th century. <clears throat> in 1717, it was proposed that a qualification for election to the South Carolina Assembly was to be the ownership of one white man. Negroes voted in the Carolina counties of Berkeley and Craven in 1706 and their votes were taken. In 1706, votes were taken by black people. Blacks were toting guns or other weapons and going about armed in the service of wealthy landowners at the same time that the tens of thousands of enslaved white men were forbidden arms. 
1678, 1,000 Negroes were armed by the planters and formed into a fighting militia for protection against the French. In Carolina in 1704 to 1741, bills were passed authorizing armed Negro militias in the service of the planters. Oh my God, I didn't realize this. So the royal governor of Virginia appointed by the king sought to win Virginia back to the British crown with black troops recruited in America to be called the Ethiopian Regiment. Parties of the blacks in the South were armed by the British with guns, clubs and swords with the order to use them against rebellious American patriots. Mm -hmm. By the 1st of December, 1775, nearly 300 Blacks in ununiform with the words liberty to slaves described Ethiopian regiment. On the 9th of December at the Battle of Great Bridge, the Lexington of the South, the British force of 600, nearly half Black, was thrown back by Woodford, all white Americans, 2nd Virginia Regiment. In April 1782, General Nathaniel Green informed Washington that the British had armed and put into uniform at least 700 blacks, the Opian Ethiopian Regiment. Was not the only black unit. That same spring, two members of the black British cavalry troops, about a hundred strong, were killed in a skirmish with Patriots at Dorchester, Virginia. Evacuating Boston, the Royal Army sailed to Halifax, the company of Negroes. It is possible that tens of thousands of black slaves in South Carolina and Georgia went over to the British. During the War of 1812, the British ranked included approximately 300 armed American Negroes who were used to combat against American forces. Some of these Negroes helped the British burn the White House in 1814. No wonder the Frederick Douglass would declare to a white audience on Independence Day, nine years before the Civil War, this 4th of July is yours, not mine. The British aristocracy purchased penchant for army Negroes and Indians for combat against white Americans are largely being been forgotten today, even though it was one of the factors which led the colonists to go to war against King George and was cited as such in the Declaration of Independence. The, de the Patriot outrage at the Indian atrocities and anger at Dunmore's manumission of Negroes was summarized by Jefferson in one of the latest quoted passages of the Declaration. He, King George, has ex exited domestic insurrection. Insurrection is an act of being against civil authority. Amongst us, this Dunmore's proclamation freeing blacks in America's jurisdiction. This is what this insurrection was and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and condition. Ariette. Who is this? Hey, Lithia, Leah. Uh, Lethe. Did I pronounce that right? Greetings. Hello. <clears throat> We're going to talk about poor whites in the Southern Confederacy now. <clears throat> Even if they attained their freedom, dirt poor whites were forced to compensate against Negro slave labor. Jobs were few and Southern planters sat idly as poor whites died of malnutrition for want of food and medicine. Negro slave were expensive. To protect their investments, white arist aristocrats usually treated their Negro slaves well, providing for adequate food, clothing, 
and medication, even as poor whites in the same town sickened and died from disease and malnutrition. Try to envision the 19th century scene, the yeoman Southern whites, sick and destitute, watching their children dying while enduring the spectacle of Negroes from the jungles of Africa. <laughs> Healthy and well-fed, thanks to the many strations of their fabulously wealthy white owners who care little or nothing for the local white trash. In the course of 1855, journey up the Alabama River on the steamboat of fashion, Frederick Law Olmsted, the landscape architect who designed New York's Central Park, he observed bales of cotton being thrown from a considerable height into a cargo ship hold. The men tossing the bales somewhat recklessly into the old hold were Negroes, and the men in the hold were Irish. Olmsted inquired about this to a mate on the ship. Oh, said the mate, the niggers are worth too much to be risked here. If the patties are knocked overboard or get their backs broke, nobody loses anything. <laughs> this is what he said about the white people <laughs> in the ships. Can you believe that? Don't that make you feel a little good, a little better about being black now? These white people just hid this information. In the antebellum South, gangs of Irish immigrants worked ditching and draining plantations, building levees, and sometimes clearing land because of the dangers to valuable Negro slaves' property. George Templeton Strong, a Whig patriot diarist, considered Irish working, working men at his home to have had prehensible paws rather than hands. He denounced the Celtic beast Irish youth, were sometimes called Irish slaves and were frequently bound boys. A common joke in the South in the pre-Civil War period was that when Blacks were ordered to work hard, they complained that their masters were treating them like Irish men. Can you imagine? <laughs> we always say Hebrew slave, but can we say Irish man? <laughs> no, we can't say Irish man. Oh, no, that's offensive. Working me like a damn Irishman. <laughs> I'm going to use that one for now on. <laughs> Working me like a damn Irishman. I'm just practicing it. Just in case I get worked hard and forced labor one day. Who knows? I might get kidnapped. I mean, I wish that on myself. <laughs> Forced a life of forced labor <laughs> in Taiwan somewhere, Vietnam. You'll find me in the jungles of Vietnam with a straw hat on <laughs> and a bag of rice. Talking about San Yan Bai. <laughs> Stop it, there you get distracted. I just cannot imagine. I can't, I'm just so. It's like, wow, like I didn't even realize it was like this for these white people. No wonder they so disgruntled. I get it. They mad. When I was a boy, recalled Waters, Macintosh, who had been a slave in Sumter, South Carolina, he used to sing rather than rather be a Negro than a poor white man. Even in slavery, we used to sing that. Oh, really? Wow. He said, even in the slavery, they used to sing being a poor nigger than a poor white man. Mr. McIntosh remarked, reveals that the poor whites of the South ranked below blacks in social standings. Slaves felt unbridled contempt for lower class whites. Frederick Douglass opened his famous life and time with an account of Tubalt County, Maryland which he said housed the white population of the lowest order. Throughout the South, the slaves of many of the larger planters lived in a society of blacks and well-to-do whites and were encouraged to view even respectable, respectable laboring whites with disdain. Ella Kelly, who had been a slave in South Carolina remarks, you know, boss, these days there's these kind of people. Lowest down is a layer of white folks. <laughs> Then in the middle is a layer of colored folks, and on top is the cream and layer of good white folks. 
The slave noticed their master's sense of superiority toward marginal farmers as well as toward poor whites and by associating themselves with the quality of white folks strengthened their self-esteem. <laughs> A slave expressed no surprise that his master, who was Big Bukra, never associated with white trash. And Rosa Stark, who had been owned by a big planter in South Carolina, reported that poor whites had been used in the kitchen door when they went up to the big house. Her mistress had a grand manner, no patience with poor whites, folks. For many Negro ex-slaves who recalled a lot recalled a lot of the small farmers and poor whites as hard and even as bad as their own knew they were talking about. The slaves saw enough abject poverty, disease, and demoralizations among the poor whites to see their own conditions under the old master protection as perhaps not the worst of evils. <laughs> this situation engendered a rage in the dis descendants and the survivors of white slavery, which has seldom been accounted for it in the history of white working class support for the Northern abolitionist, abolitionist cause. Let me repeat this. The situation engendered rage. This gets repressed in our society. This has been repressed. What repressed this rage though? We gotta go back in history and try to figure out what happened around, like after the 40s, 20s and 40s. What repressed this rage in these white people? I'll think about it. I'll figure it out. But I gotta keep reading. So these descendants are descendants of all these people who had into all this rage. They repressed this and got passed down all down to their descendants. And the survivors of white slavery, which has seldom been accounted for in the history of the white working class support for the Northern abolitionist cause. We can gauge the attitudes of Yemen whites, especially in the border states like Kentucky and Tennessee, but throughout the USA as well as who were either neutral during the Confederacy Confederacy struggles or sided with the Lincolns from the statement of Iowa Congress, who remained that it was the planters' aristocracy which exalts the sp and spreads Africans at the expense of the white race. Some of the leaders of the Free Soil Party and many of the Unionist soldiers who made up the ranks of Lincoln's army in southern Ohio, western North Carolina, eastern Tennessee. Southern Illinois, Kentucky, and elsewhere were survivors of white slavery or descendants of white slaves. Wow. They did not view themselves as advocates of what was then referred to as racial amalgamation. amalgamation. Historically, they regarded themselves as separatists and viewed the Southern planters' desire to spread Negroes into California, Oregon, and other territories as a grave threat to the free white labor and the Old Testament principles of racial separation. Congressman David Wilmock sponsored a law to ban black slavery in the American West. He dubbed his proposed law, the white man's provi pro proviso. He was bitterly opposed by the Southern elite. Wilmot told Congress that he intended to preserve America's Western frontier for the sons of the toil for the sons of the toil by own race and color. During much of the Civil War, the political and military leaders of the Confederacy could not travel in certain parts of the Deep South without armed escorts. The Civil War, the United States at War audio classic series, for fear of attack from the upcountry Southern whites who hated the planters' aristocracy and the war, they saw as being for the sole benefit of the expansion of the planters' infernal Negroes. Their upcountry Southern whites consisted in large part of the survivors and the children of survivors of white slavery who resided in the hills, mountains, and Piedmont regions of the South under frontier conditions. In the antebellum 19th century South, a large number of the white Southerners lived in the upcountry, an area of small farmers and herdsmen engaging largely in mixed and subsistence agriculture, 
little currency circulated. Barter was common in upcountry families dressed in homespun clothes, the product of the spinning wheel and handlooms. This economic order gave rise to a distinctive subculture that celebrated mutuality and egalitarianism for whites and independents. These are like these Amish people now that's wearing those like hand spun clothes, <laughs> home spun cloths and stuff with the spinning wheel and the handlooms. They, they still do that to this day. Mountain countries rejected secessions from the outset. Once citizens of Winston County in the northern Alabama Hill counties rebuilt Yemen's had no business fighting for the plant planter dominated aristocracy. All they want is to get you to fight for their infernal Negroes. And after you do their fighting, you may kiss their hand part, their hind parts for, for all the, all the care. What does he mean? All they want is to get you to fight for their infernal Negroes. And after you do their fighting, you may kiss their hind parts for all the care. For whites had to be drafted into the Confederate Army as in the North, where resistance to conscription was widespread. Many Southern whites saw the conflict as a rich man's war and a poor man's fight. Indeed, any slaveholder owning 20 or more black slaves was exempt from military combat. From 1609 until the early 1800s, between one half and two thirds of all the white colonists who came to the new world came as slaves. Slaves from 1609 to 1800, one half to two thirds of the white colonists in this new world were slaves. Other passengers on the Mayflower, 12 were white slaves. White slaves cleared the forests, drained the swamps, they built the roads, they worked and died in greater numbers than anyone else. Both psychologically and materially, whites in modern times are called upon to bear a burden of guilt and monetary reparations for Negro slavery. Both psychologically and materially, whites in modern times are called upon to bear the burden of guilt. This is where y'all guilt is coming from, white people. Psychologically and monetarily with these welfare programs. These are the reparations for Negro slavery. This position is based entirely on enforced ignorance and the deliberate suppression of the records of white slavery in North America. So y'all gonna be doing this denial and guilt constantly with the welfare programs. Hundreds and thousands of whites have been enslaved during the colonial area in America while millions of others were too poor to afford even a mule, much less a black slave. Slave reparations and guilty feelings are due if one subscribes to such a thing as retroactive collective guilt. This is what he called it. This guilt is retroactive collective guilt. I don't know. Google it. <laughs> Google it. From the descendants of the minority of wealth, wealthy whites who owned Negro slaves and who in the South, at least, were themselves genuinely reduced to punery in the aftermath of the Civil War. Reparations would also have to be paid by the descendants of the Cherokee and other American Indian tribes who owned black slaves and by the heirs of black tribal leaders in Africa who sold them into slavery. Mm -hmm. That's a good argument because if we're looking for reparations from this America, we need to be also looking for these as well from Africa and these Cherokee Indians as well. Reparations must also be paid if the logic of the situation is to be consistent to the modern day white descendants of the white slaves of early America. The whole discussion of Negro slavery, Southern racism, and the Civil War has currently framed by the establishment agenda necessarily must exclude any examinations of the facts of white slavery, of course, especially in the 17th and 18th century, and the conditions of the free white poors in the 19th century forced to compete against Negro slave labor in the South. 
Where we at? All right, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. I'm gonna try to make these videos about like an hour and a half each. And then we'll just keep reading until my eyes pop out, like I said. Go pee. Because I'm learning so much now about American history. Whites were the first slaves in America. Next chapter. The enslavement of whites extended throughout the American colonies and white slave labor was a crucial factor in the economic development of the colonies. Gradually, it developed into a fixed system, every bit as rigid and codified as Negro slavery was to become. In fact, Negro slavery was efficiently established in colonial America because black slaves were governed organized and controlled by the structures and organizations that were first used to enslave and control whites. Black slaves were late commerce fitted into a system already developed. White slavery was the historic base upon which Negro slaves was constructed. The important structures, labor, the labor ideologies and social relations necessary for slavery already had been established within indentured servitude white servitude in many ways came remarkably close to the ideal type of shadow slavery, which later became associated with the African experience. The practice developed and tolerated in the kidnapping of whites laid the foundation for the kidnapping of Negroes. The official papers of the white slave trade refer to adult white slaves as fright and white slaves, child slaves were termed half fright. <laughs> Half right. <laughs> the fright, like, ah! and then the kids were half right. Like, ah! <laughs> 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 kind of like, oh, there's a nigger. Oh, there's a nigglet. Nigger, nigglet, nigger, nigger, nigglet, nigger, 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 nigger. <laughs> In the American colonies prospered through the use of white slaves, which Virginia planters Joy Pori declared in 1619 were our principal wealth. The white servants, a semi-slave, was more important in the 17th century than even the Negro slave in respect to both number and economic significance. Where mainstream history books or films touched on white slavery, it is referred to with the deceptively mild sounding title of the indentured servitude. The implication being that the enslavement of whites was not as terrible or all encompassing as Negro slavery, but constituted instead a more benign bondage than of servitude. Yet the term servant and slave were often used interchangeably to refer to people whose status was clearly that of permanent lifetime enslavement. An account of English sugar plantations in the British Museum, written circuit 1660 to 1685, refers to black and white slaves as servants. The colonies were plentifully supplied with Negro and Christian servants, which were of, are the nerves and sinews of the plantations. Christians was of euphemism for whites. In the North American colonies in the 17th and 18th centuries and subsequently in the United States, servants were the usual designations for a slave. The use of the word servant to describe a slave would have been very prevalent among a Bible literate people 
by colonial Americans and all English translations of the Bible available at the time from Wycliffe to the 1611 King James Version, the world, the word slave as it appears in the original biblical language was translated as servant. For example, the King James Version of Genesis 9.25 is rendered, cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be. The intended meaning here is clearly that of slave, and there is little doubt that the mind of the early Americans, the word servant was synonymous with slave. In the original documents of white merchants who transported Negroes from Africa to blacks were called transported Negroes from Africa, the blacks were called servants. One notes that the company of royal adventurers referred to their cargo as negers or negro servants, servants from Africa. The documentary records debunk the propaganda that slavery was strictly a racist operation, part of the conspiracy of white supremacy because one, whites as well as blacks were enslaved and two, in the 17th century, slaves of both races were called servants. And three, the colonial merchants of the 17th century America had no qualms about enslaving their own whites, kindreds. And this is Oscar Handelin. And he writes, through the first three quarters of the 17th century, that's 1600s, y'all, the Negroes, even in the South, were not numerous. They came into a society in which a large part of the white population was to some degree unfree. The Negro lack of freedom was not unusual. These black newcomers, like so many others, were accepted, bought, and held as kind of servants. It was in this sense that Negro servants were sometimes called slaves. For that matter, it also applied to white Englishmen in New England and New York to their had early been an intense desire for cheap, unfree hands, for bond slavery, villainage, or ca captivity, whether to be white, Negro, or Indian. The early laws against runaways, against drunkenness, against carrying arms or trading without permission had applied penalties as heavy as death to all servants, Negroes, and whites. A survey of the various ad hoc codes and regulations devised in the 17th century for the governing of those in bondage reveals no special category for black slaves. During Ligon's time in Barbados, 1647 to 1650, white indentured female servants worked in the field gains alongside the small but rapidly growing number of enslaved black women. In this formative stage of the sugar revolution, planters did not attempt to formulate a division of labor along racial lines. White indentured servants were not perceived by their masters as worthy of special treatment in the labor regiment. Whiteness and independence were not firmly connected, nor was blackness yet fully linked with servitude. The contemporary academic consensus on slavery in America represents history by retroactive fiat, decreeing that conclusions about the entire epoch fits the characterizations of its final stage, the 19th century Southern plantation system, 17th century colonial slavery, and 19th century American slavery are not a seamless garment. Historians who pretend otherwise have to maintain several fallacies, the chief among these being the supposition that when white servants constituted the majority of servile laborers in the colonial period, they worked in privileged or even luxurious conditions, which were forbidden to blacks. And this would be a fallacy, and they would have to maintain that if they in the 17th century colonial slavery and 19th century slavery are if they're going to maintain that there's a the difference between the slavery in Europe and Africa, I mean in America with the blacks. They're going to have to also prove that the white people were being treated well as well, and they can't do that. So they just discounted and discredited the whole thing, right? Because they don't want to admit to the treatment of that. 
This is what's sustaining white guilt right here. Y'all got to fess up to how y'all treated each other as well. As y'all was killing off each other's y'all kids and stuff like this. And we're having them working in chimneys and factories and their limbs are being chopped off. You don't think that's going to accrue any guilt in y'all? In truth, white slaves were often restricted to doing the dirty, backbreaking field work while blacks and even the Indians were taken into the plantation mansion houses to work as domestics. Contemporaries were aware that the popular stereotyping of white female indentured servants as whores and sluts and debauched witches discouraged their use in elite planter house households. Many pioneer planters preferred to employ a mirror they call them a meridian women in their households with the establishments of an elitist social culture. And there was a tendency to reject white indentured servants as domestics and black women represented a more attractive option. And as a result, the widely employed as domestics in the second half of the 17th century. 1675, for example, John Blake, who had recently arrived on the island of Barbados, informed his brother in Ireland that his white indentured servants was a slut and he would like to be rid of her in favor of a Negro wench. In the 17th century, white slaves were cheaper to acquire than Negroes and therefore were often mistreated to a greater extent. Having paid a bigger price for a Negro, the planters treated the black better, blacks better than they did their Christian white servants. Even the Negroes recognized this and did not hesitate to show their contempt for their white men who they could see were worse off than themselves. It was white slaves who built America from its very beginning and made up the overwhelming majority of slave laborers in the colonies in the 17th century. Negro slaves seldom had to do the kind of virtually lethal work the white slaves of America did in the formative years of settlement. The frontier demands for heavy manual labor, such as filling trees, soil clearance, and general infrastructural development had been satisfied primarily by white indentured servants between 1627 and 1643. The merchant class of early America has an equal opportunity in slavery and, and viewed with enthusiasm the bondage of all poor people within their grasp, including their own white kinsmen. There was a president for this in the English legal concept of villainage, a form of medieval white slavery in England. As late as 1669, those who thought of large scale agriculture assumed it would be man man manned not by Negroes, but by servile whites under a condition of villainage. John Locke's constitution for South Carolina envisaged an, an hereditary group of servile leapmen. The Lord Shaftbury Signory or Lock Island in 1674 actually attempts to put the scheme into practice. The Littman, L. This was, uh, they tried to put some, this hereditary group of servile litmans and Lord Shaftesbury, they tried to go to Signory on Lock Island in 1674 to attempt the scheme to practice this agricultural large scale uh, land that was going to be manned by Negro, uh, by white people under a condition of villainage. And they wanted to do this on this Lockman Island in 1674. The Random House Dictionary of the English language defines servitude as slavery or bondage of any kind. The dictionary defines bondage as being bound by or subjected to external control. It defines slavery as ownership of a person or persons by another or others. Hundreds of thousands of whites in colonial America were owned outright by their masters and died in slavery. They had no control over their own lives and were auctioned on the block and examined like livestock, exactly like black slaves, with the exception that these whites were enslaved by their own race. White slaves found themselves powerless as individuals without honor or respect and driven into commodity production, not by any inner sense of moral duty, but by the outer stimulus of the whip.
Upon arrival in America, white slaves were put up for sale by the ship ca captains or merchants. Families were often separated under these circumstances when wives and offspring were auctioned off to the highest bidder. This was by Foster R. Doles in the book, Labor in America, A History. I just wanted to give y'all that reference because this is, I never heard this before of white families being separated. Wow. Foster R. Doles. Anyway. Eleanor Bradbury sold with her three sons to a Maryland owner was separated from her husband who was bought by a man in Pennsylvania. White people who were passed over for purchase at the point of entry were taken into the back country by soil drivers who herded them along like cattle to a Smithfield market and then put them up for auction at public fairs. Pros prospective buyers felt their muscles check their teeth like cattle. Indentured servants were sold at auction, sometimes after being stripped necked. We were exposed to sell to public fairs as so many brute beasts. Contemporary accounts liking them to livestock auctions. They are brought in here, a person noted and sold in the same manner as horses or cows in our market on fair or fair. Green recalled, their search used there as the, they search us there as the dealers and horses do those animals in this country by looking at our teeth you are in our limbs. They are frequently horrid in droves under the custody of several brutal drivers in the back countries to be disposed as a servant. Those whites for whom no buyer could be found even after marketing them inland were returned to the slave trader to be sold for a pittance. These white were, whites were officially referred to as refuse in lumps. Unloading large number wholesales called lumping was generally a last resort that yielded smaller rewards. White slave James Cheston wrote to his partner, the servants go off slower than I expected. I shall try them a few days longer in the retail way and then lump the remainder. Larger scale purchasers generally retail servants farther inland. They dive them through the they drive them through the country like a parcel of sheep until they can sell them to advantage, wrote white slave John Howarwer. The Virginia Company arranged with the city of London to have a hundred poor white children out of the swarms that swarm in the place sent to Virginia in 1619 for sale to the wealthy planters of the colonies to be used as slave labor. The Privy Council of London theorized, authorized the Virginia Company to imprison, punish, and dispose of any of those children upon any disorder by them committed, as cause shall require. The trade in white slaves was a natural one for English merchants who imported sugar and tobacco from the colonies. Whites kidnapped in Britain could be exchanged directly for this produce. The trade in white slaves was basically a return haul operation. The operations of Captain Henry Brain were typical. In November of 1670, Captain Brain was ordered to sail from Carolina with a consignment of timber for sale in the West Indies. For, from there, he was set, set sail for London with a load of sugar purchased with the profit from the sale of the timber. In England, he was to sell the sugar and fill his ship with from 200 to 300 white slaves to be sold in Carolina. This was in 1670. The notion of the contract and of the legal statutes of the whites in servitude became a fiction as a result of the exigencies of the occasion. In 1623, George Sandy, the treasurer of Virginia, was forced to sell the only remaining 11 white slaves of his company for lack of provisions to support them. Seven of these white people were sold for 150 pounds of tobacco. The slave statues of whites held in colonial bondage can also be seen by studying the disposition 
the deposition of the estates of the wealthy whites. Mm, depositions. Just, uh, this is studying the dispositions of the estates. If y'all want to understand. I don't know how we're going to get these records, though. Google it. Whites and bondage were rated as inventories and disposed of by will and by deed, along with the rest of the property. I guess we can't Google that, can we? Dispositions of estates are wealthy white people. We definitely ain't going to find information like this. They were bought, sold, bartered, gambled away, mortgaged, and weighed on scales like farm animals and taxed as property. White people in America. We ain't no, oh, child, no, get him, get him, get him, get him, get him, get him. <laughs> oh my God. No, don't do it. Charlemagne, don't do it. All right, guys, where we at with this chapter? Should I make another loop? No, I'm almost done. And then we're going to finish up. Richard Ligon, a contemporary eyewitness to the white slavery in his 1657, A True and Exact History, tells of the white slave, a woman who was being traded by her master for a pig. Both the pig and the white woman were weighed on a scale. The price was set for a groat a pound for the hog's flesh and six pence for the woman's flesh. In general, whites were not treated with the relative dignity the term indentured servant connotes, but as degraded chattel, part of the personal estate of the master and on a par with his farm animals. The term indentured servitude, therefore, is nothing more than a propagandistic softening of the historic experience of enslaved white people mm -hmm. in order to make a false distinction between their suffering and those of the Negro slaves. This, this is what it's been this whole time. Just a propaganda, it's been propaganda that's softened or to assuage their servitude, their real value. And we've been fed a lot uh, this whole time. They've been slaves this whole time. Calm down, Cornelius. I just know it. Indentured servants. Black people don't even bring this up ever. We never bring this up. They were slaves, y'all. And them rich white people just protecting, they protecting the identities of them. But not everybody's being complicit. This is not to deny the existence of a fortunate class of whites who could in fact be called indentured servants. According to the modern conception of the term, who worked under privileged conditions of limited bondage for a specific period of time, primarily as apprentices, these lucky few were given religious instructions and could sue in a court of law. They were employed and to return their transportation to America and room and board during that period of service. But certain historians pretend that this apprentice system, the privileges, form of bound labor was representative of the entire experience of white bondage in America. In actuality, the indentured apprentice system represented the conditions of only a tiny segment of the whites in bondage in early America. Mm -hmm. Strictly speaking, the terms indented servants should apply only to those persons who had bound themselves voluntarily to the service, but it is generally used for all classes of bond servants. Richard M. Morris in Government and Labor in Early America notes that in colonies, however, apprenticeships were merely a highly specialized and favored form of bound labor. The more comprehensive colonial institutions included all persons bound to labor for periods of years as determined either by agreement or by law, both minors and adults, and Indians and Negroes as well as whites. In a reversal of our contemporary ideas about white indenture and black slavery, many blacks in colonial America were often contemporary bondsmen freed after a period of time. Peter Hancock arranged for a Negro servant named Aisha 
to serve for 12 months and is forced to be a free person. Black indentured servants in the 18th century, that 1700s, even had a education clause in their contracts. You don't say. Free Negroes, and they say in quote, free Negro boys bound out as apprentices were often given the benefit of an educational clause in the indenture. How is this possible? When they're telling us that they couldn't even be allowed to read. Two such cases occurred in the princes and county records. One in 1719 to learn the trade of Tanner. So this was a trade. He this was an educational trade. The master to teach him to read. What? This was in 1719. I would love to get a hold of this clause. Ooh, I would love to get it. These county records. Something went awry in the slavery experience. I promise you there's a demon that turned everything and then we got fed that story. So, but we had dignity before this. I promise you, 1719, they don't talk much about this time period. We only get fed everything that happened in the 19th, 20th century, usually in American history, right? And then the other, it was in 1727, to learn the trade of gunsmith, the master to teach him to read the Bible distinctively. This was two county records that they found in Princess Anne County records in 1719 that they had educational clause in their indentured servant contracts. Wow, newspaper and court records in South Carolina cite a free Negro fellow named John Holmes lately, an indented servant with Nicholas Trott and a Negro man commonly called Jack Cutler. He is a free Negro having faithfully served out his time and with four years uh, according to the contract agreed upon, David L. Gallinson in the author of an Orwellian suppression of the horror and conditions of white slavery entitled White Servitude in Colonial America. He states concerning white slaves, European men and women would exercise choice both in deciding whether to migrate to the colonies and in choosing possible designations. This is positive, positively misleading. I know, right? And at the bare minimum, hundreds of thousands of white slaves were kidnapped off the streets and the roads of Great Britain in the courses of more than 150 years and sold to captains of slave ships in London known as white Guyana men. You can Google that. Ten thousand whites were kidnapped from England in the year of 1670 alone. The very word kidnapper was first coined in Britain in the 1600s to describe those who captured and sold white children into slavery. Kidnapping. Another whitewash is the heralded classic work on the subject. Abbott Emerson, Smith Colonists in Bondage, which is one long cover up of the extent of the kidnappings, the denial of the existence of white slavery and numerous other apologies for the establishments, including a cover up of the deportation and enslavements of the Irish people, but the record proves otherwise. And that's the end of this, is it? Oh no, this is, let me keep going. Kidnapper, originally one who stole or decoyed, oh, this is the claw, this is how they coined this word, kidnap. Can you see? Some pictures if y'all interested in these, and I guess the. Mm -hmm.
These are survivors of white slavery. There's the pictures. Does any of them y'all ancestors that look familiar? This is a picture of two deaths of two human brooms. You know, those are the white kids, four-year-olds who was climbing up the chimneys. more pictures oh sorry guys oh Sharecropper is a picture. If y'all want proof, they got proof. He even got proof of the pictures. He got receipts, receipts in here. Okay, so the next chapter gonna be Irish slaves in another chapter or uh, in another video, guys. Woo, let's go. Let's go. Let's keep going. <laughs>